Too bad. Don't miss Sunday school class. Matthew chapter 3. <coughs> Matthew chapter 3. Jonathan, how you doing, buddy? You doing good? Verse 1, the Bible says, uh, in those days, where are you going to go? Go back to verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern, gir leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. They went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Father, I pray that you would teach us from your word today how it is that, God, we could first of all be used effectively the way that you used this man, this man, John the Baptist. Lord, I pray that you would help us as well today to see the truth of the gospel as it comes out and the truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that He was the anointed Savior. And I pray that You would help us to follow as a result of that. We just thank You for what You teach us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we really looked at the provision of the Lord Jesus and we saw some of the things that had to do uh, with the miracles that proved that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And we, we saw specifically a second time and had another look at Joseph, the way that God had used Joseph to protect, uh, had to protect Mary. That's kind of one of the things we had in his sight. And one of the major themes that we saw last week was the theme that any time the gospel is preached or any time a person is confronted with the gospel, which is Jesus, then they have a choice. And every time... Jesus is presented. People make a choice of belief or unbelief. We saw last week the irony that the people in Jerusalem where Jesus' star came to, or where Jesus' star was, Jerusalem, where the people who literally He was their King, the people who should have been thrilled about the Messiah, the Anointed One being born, Jerusalem is the place where Herod and the Jews were troubled by the birth of Jesus. And the irony was that from Babylon, which was not Jewish, which was not Jerusalem, to whom the people of Babylon didn't have any covenant promises to, from God like the people of Israel had, yet those individuals saw Jesus' star in the east and they came to worship Him. And rather than being troubled, they sought Him. There's a big difference uh, we saw last week between what people do with the truth. We saw as well that people do believe what they want to believe, don't they? The reality of it is, is that facts are what they are, and if you're seeking truth, you'll find it. But you'll believe what you want to. And that's what we saw last week. That facts have nothing to do with what you actually believe. You believe what you choose to believe. And so you can believe the truth and know it's the truth, or you can know what the truth is and not believe it. And we're all prone to that. We're all guilty of that same thing. Well, this week, we're going to be introduced to the one who had a forth-telling or the ground-laying preaching ministry. It's fascinating, uh, literally, how short, how brief the ministry of two people in the Gospel was, the first being John the Baptist and the second being Jesus. See, Jesus' earthly ministry lasted for a very, very short span of just a couple of years. Literally, just a couple of years, Jesus entire ministry which changed the world. He came to die for sin. It didn't take him very long to prove that he was God and to die on the cross for sins, having fulfilled every prophecy of the Scripture. But Jesus' ministry is very short-lived. It's really a phenomenal thing, isn't it? That literally today, this morning, across the world, people are needing and worshiping the Lord Jesus in their respective time zones because it's the Lord's Day, because of what Jesus did when He came to die for sins. It's amazing what kind of a Savior we have. It's not just a coincidence. It's not just, 
you know, this could possibly be a Savior. You know, my friend, Jesus was God. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the Scripture that showed that He was God. And Jesus Christ is one who was able to not only save life, but to transform people and to transform ultimately nations of people if they, as a, as a whole, follow Him. Now here we are uh, looking at the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. And I just want to look this morning, if you will permit me, at the kind of people that God uses. And I hope you'll be encouraged by it. First of all, uh, we see John the Baptist in verse 1 of chapter 3. We're introduced to him. Of course, the other Gospels present different, different ministries about John. But in this ministry, we're introduced to John the Baptist as a preacher in the wilderness. Look at verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, it's really, really amazing when you think of the actual location. Uh, it, things have not changed with the definition of the word wilderness between then and now. Today, if you and I say something like, we're in the wilderness, or we were in the wilderness, we're not thinking of a great habitation of people, are we? I just think it's fascinating, don't you, the location where John the Baptist preached. He preached in the wilderness. Out where nothing was at. If you were to go to John chapter 11, let's, I mean Matthew chapter 11, let's go ahead and do that. Matthew chapter 11, and I want to look at the nature of the ministry of John the Baptist. Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. And uh, he has just given his uh, disciples his, the commands and sent out his 12 disciples. And, but verse 7 of John chapter 11 uh, the, Jesus has just given them the power and John's in prison and he sent disciples to find out about Jesus. Verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. So Jesus emphasizes the notable ministry that John the Baptist went to, that John the Baptist had. In other words, the Bible says in the wilderness that multitudes went out from Judea and to, to hear him preach. And multitudes were baptized in the wilderness. Now it doesn't say desert, it says wilderness, which is in an uninhabited place. And so now Jesus is speaking to people in the place where he is, and he's saying, why did you go all the way out there to hear John the Baptist? Or why did you go out there? Did you go to see a reed shaking in the wind? What was the attraction in the wilderness? What was the attraction out in no man's land that made you go out there? Now think of it. You know, there are places where, you know, it's kind of desolate that you go, and you kind of go to see the desolation, don't you? Have you ever been to Moab, Utah? Charlie has. Pretty pretty desolate place, actually, except for all the people on the weekends, right? But, I mean, you're just out in the middle of the desert, and you've got these red rocks, and it's just a, a gorgeous place, but it's, it's really uninhabitable. I mean, there's no source of water. You're not going to drill for water in Moab, Utah. If you have water there, you brought it in in a jug. It's extremely hot. And, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's not a place that anything's going to grow, but it's just a place that's just vast and it's just beautiful. And if I'm going to go to Moab, Utah, it's a place that four-wheel four drive people like. You know, guys that like to do four-wheel, and they get their, uh, you know, special rock climbing trucks, and they go out and climb up and over hills and flip their trucks upside down and so forth. And they do it with with four-wheelers and everything. Matter of fact, when you get out in that part of the of the United States West, there are towns where, I mean, literally, people are just driving around on four-wheelers. You kind of, and they're just, just four-wheel uh, ATVs absolutely everywhere. Why do people go there? Why do they go out in the wilderness? Well, they want to ride four-wheelers, that's why. They want to get out away from people. They want to go where there ain't nothing, and they're hoping if you get away from habitation, then you won't see anybody. But why did the multitudes go into the wilderness in the time of Jesus? Why did the multitudes go into the wilderness in the time of Jesus? To see a reed shaking in the wind? In other words, did you want to go see a, you know, a reed blowing in the breeze? Was that the attraction? And Jesus is pointing out that the attraction was John the Baptist. Now it's interesting, when we read in Matthew chapter 1, when we read the description of John the Baptist, you know, it, the fact is, is that it wasn't like people went to see a man in the circus. It's, it's, it, in Matthew chapter 3, I meant to say, the same John, you say in chapter 11, I just want to read this to you. The same John had his garment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Now, some of you guys might go to see that, but most of the ladies wouldn't. Right? In other words, guys wearing camel clothes, clothes made from camel's hair. Uh, camels already stink. 
You know, you put, I guarantee you, John didn't have a shower out there in the wilderness. <laughs> he's wearing a cam, camel hair clothing, and he's got a girdle made out of leather. You know, I don't know what kind of leather it was. But, I mean, you know, hoping he had, you know, that he bought the belt somewhere. Uh, and got it made from a cow. But who knows what kind of leather it was. Probably wasn't snake skin or lizard skin, I don't suppose. And then what he ate was locusts and wild honey. Here's a guy eating grasshoppers, basically, or locusts. Uh, and, you know, don't knock it till you've tried it, I always say. But the reality of it is, is that this is, you know, something to hear about. But if I hear about a guy wearing camel's hair and leather girdle, especially in the century in which he lived, I'm probably not going to travel out into no man's land to see him. And what is Jesus' point then in John chapter or Matthew chapter 11? I keep saying John because I always think of John as the gospel. Matthew's also. This is Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 8, Jesus said, What went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. He says, you know, you didn't go out to see noblemen. You didn't go out to see royalty. You didn't go out to see a guy that was somebody that had special clothes. Those people are in the king's house, not out in the wilderness. And so he's pointed out that the, the location was not the attraction. And the persona of John the Baptist was not the attraction. Why did multitudes, that's the question, why did multitudes go out to hear or to see John the Baptist? Why did they go out there? Well, it wasn't because of what he wore, and it wasn't because of where he was. That's Jesus' point. But Jesus said in verse 9, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. Now, if we were to study, if we were to go to Isaiah chapter 40, and read the prophecy in verse 3 about the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make, prepare you the way of the Lord, make His path straight. This is John the Baptist. Jesus is here saying what was special about John the Baptist was not his person. What was special about John the Baptist was his calling or the person that he represented. See, he was the one that was to make straight the way of the Lord, prepare his path. He was the one who was to come before the Lord Jesus, that forth-telling prophet, that Elias that was prophesied to come. That's what was special about John the Baptist. So what was uh, so what was what was it then that was the draw? Well, look at verse five. If you go back, if you permit me, to chapter three and verse five. It is not what was special about John the Baptist. It's what John the Baptist was called to do, and it was the message that John the Baptist preached. And I just want to make one simple point this morning. I'm probably going to shock you and end early. In verse. 4, or verse 5 of chapter 3, the Bible says, Then went out all to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And the Bible says, And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. What was the draw to John the Baptist? The draw to John the Baptist was the need for the Savior. In other words, there's nothing special about the guy. I was joking with uh, Charlie, this morning we were passing by the Prosperity Gospel Place on Commercial Boulevard, and they, they had police, you know, because they had to direct traffic because they just had so many people coming at, you know, eight o'clock this morning to their services. And I said, it must be a lot better church than ours over there. You know, God does judge and no hearts and so forth. But they got a good attendance. There's a lot of people going there. I'll tell you what. I know why people are going to that place, and I don't mind it. To, to, to um, it really. It's really kind of heartbreaking, but people are going there because of what they're offering. You know, they're offering a message. That's what people want to hear. Uh, they're, they have programs. They have things. They have facilities. It's impressive what you get there. You'd be impressed by the music. You'd be impressed by the messenger. The messenger, you'd be impressed by the message. And uh, they've got a lot to offer. You've got programs. they got stuff they can do for you. They, uh, but the, the, the question is, what's the message? Well, I know some of the folks there. And I'll tell you what the message is. The message isn't what the Bible teaches. They tell lies about the Holy Spirit of God. 
They tell lies about the purpose of God, the calling of God. You know, and the question is, what attracts those people there? Well, it isn't the truth. It isn't the truth. There are people seeking truth, though. And what's amazing to me is the contrast between that and between the truth. What is it that will draw people to Jesus? What is it that will draw people to Jesus? And I'll tell you simply what it is, just the simple truth. So many times we're looking to package the Gospel. We're looking to put it in a nice box and cover it with an attractive wrapping and present it in with a nice bow tied up on it with the most beautiful of paper and we're, we're trying to tie it up to make it look good. Friend, I'm going to just tell you something. There's nothing that looked good about John the Baptist. I promise you, you probably wouldn't want to get too close to the guy. Um, not to be too descriptive, but it only takes me about a few hours out in, in some place that's extremely hot with no shower before you don't want to get too close to me. And the guy was wearing camel's hair. I promise you that didn't help anything. All right, so do you get it? In other words, John the Baptist wasn't come, be, wasn't, they didn't come to see him because of his comely appearance. They came to see him because of who he was and what his message was. Who was he? Well, he was the one that was the foreteller of the Savior. He was the one that was baptizing people for the remission of sins. And that literally is his gospel. His gospel is that the one, uh, that, that uh, this is the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. So why do people come to see him? Because, my friend, the same thing that is true today was true then, and that is that people needed the Lord Jesus. The Bible says they came, they were baptized, confessing their sins. Why did they come to see Jesus, John the Baptist? Well, because John the Baptist was preaching Jesus. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message, not a complicated message. It was the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did they come to see John the Baptist? John the Baptist was preaching Jesus. And my friend, that's what people need. That's what people need. You know, we need, we need in our churches, I think, to be more simple, more direct, and more the John the Baptist like. Now, I encourage you to go ahead and shower this week. I encourage you to go ahead and uh, dress as nicely as you're able to. But friend, I would encourage you as well to realize that the reason we're here is because of what we need. And what we need is forgiveness for our sins. We need Jesus. And what we need to preach, and what needs to be the going forth, the predominant message, the only message of the church, is that Jesus Christ died for sins, and we need to preach the Gospel. I'll close with this. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I took a... It was, it was a vacation is what it was. didn't feel like it, but that's what it was. My vacations never really feel like a vacation. First, I went camping with all my wife's family. And uh, I'm not going to drop any mother-in-law jokes here. But I went camping with my mother-in-laws uh, and, and my family for like almost a week in Arkansas. It was a lovely time. But I spent a lot of time just driving around, picking people up and spending time with people, which is actually what I do when I'm not on vacation. What I do when I'm not on vacation is I spend a lot of time with a lot of people, you know. And so for me, a vacation is to delete people from my life and to go somewhere in the wilderness and see a reed shaking in the wind with no John the Baptist anywhere around. Okay, so I did that for a week. And then, and then when I was returning to come home for Sunday, then we had a, a little hurricane come along. Hurricane Irma, and I said, ah, I'm not going home. And so I went up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Okay, why well, I tell you all that? Well, when I go on vacation, I do the same thing that I do here. That is, on Wednesday night and uh, Sunday, I go to church. And I worship the Lord Jesus. <coughs> I'll just tell you something. This is not. This is just reflective of our church and all churches. It's not bashing anything or anybody in particular. But it occurred to me, by the third service, I tried to visit a church. First of all, I had a very, very difficult time to go to a church where they're actually preaching and fellow doing the things that, that are described as a church service in the Scripture. I had a hard time just finding a church, especially on Sunday and Wednesday nights, where they actually were preaching the Word of God and where they are actually teaching the Word of God and just where it was like going to church. You know, the Bible study or whatever that is, the prayer meeting, I guess, has replaced the church, except that they don't pray and they just 
I mean, I literally went into a lot of churches where people, they were having a Wednesday night meal and they are sitting around tables. And they are just chatting. They weren't studying the Bible. They were just chatting. And you know, it's very awkward for a guy who's visiting to go and sit at a table with strangers who are just having a personal conversation. It's like going to McDonald's and sitting at somebody's table. You know, you just feel like, okay, I don't really... Now, that's fun some days, but not when I want to go to church to do that sort of thing. And so that was much of my experience. One night, my wife and I went to church five times before we found one that was actually holding a church service. Now I'm kidding you. Five churches had advertised services on their internet or on their, on their outside board. When we showed up, they were doing other things. The first one we went, one of the first ones we went to, they were having a shrimp bowl. That's how they say it in Arkansas, shrimp bowl. That means they were boiling shrimp. And so we showed up, and they had a posted service. And I noticed that people were all buzzing around the parking lot. Kids were in the playground. And, and I said, Are there, is there church night? Oh, no, we're having a shrimp ball. And they invited me to go to their shrimp ball. But I didn't want to go to shrimp ball. I wanted to be preached to. See, I preach all the time. But I wanted to hear preaching. And it occurred to me uh, that you weren't going to hear any preaching there that evening. So I, I went and tried three other churches and finally found one. I, luckily, I was early enough that I had time to just check a bunch of churches. And I found one that was, that was actually having a preaching service that night. And uh, they were great people, nice people. The preaching was, uh, maybe it was a bad day or something. Um, I'm just telling you something. I went, um, how many services was I gone for? Two Sunday services, and then a Wednesday, and two more Sunday services, and another Wednesday. I tried to go to church six times on my vacation. No, more than six times. Twice, two cents? Yeah, okay, at least six times I tried to go to church on my vacation. And it occurred to me when I got home that if I were lost, I'd have been just as lost after trying to go to probably 20 churches, Baptist churches. It occurred to me that after going to about 20 Baptist churches, because most of them didn't, just didn't have anything at all. Or, you know, I went to one and they said, oh, we're just having a meeting with the junior hires tonight. We're just having a back-to-school fun thing. So they're having that instead of church. And it just occurred to me that if I were lost and I tried 20 times to go to those churches, which all of them, to, to give them the benefit of the doubt, ought to have been places where I probably could have heard the gospel. But on that couple of weeks' time that I was looking to be ministered to and to be preached to, I failed about 20 times. And it wasn't that the churches weren't doing anything, it's just that it had nothing to do with what a church should do, which is to preach the gospel. To point Jesus, point people to Jesus. In other words, there's a lot going on in a lot of those places. The last church I went to, they were uh, they were having a guy in. They were considering uh, calling him to be their pastor. There's stuff going on. You know, they they were having a junior high meeting on one. They were having a shrimp bowl at another one. They were having this. They were having that. They were having dinner. They were having whatever. But if I were lost and I went to the place that a lost person would logically go, I'd have left just as lost as I came. And at that point, I felt like, man, if there's a guy preaching in the wilderness, I'd drive a long ways to hear him. Because what I just need is some good preaching. I just need some truth. I need God to speak to me from His Word and by His messenger. It's what I need. I don't need any of the extra. So that's all there is, it seems like. There's just a lot of fluff in our churches today, but there isn't anything that people are actually looking for. And it occurs to me that we could use some John the Baptist preaching nowadays. I just happen to think you could take an ugly old guy that can't talk very well, who knows who Jesus is and proclaims it, and I think it would draw a crowd. Because the fact is that people don't even know where to go to find Jesus nowadays. But if they heard that you could find Jesus here, I think they'd beat the door down. And that's what we need to be as believers and as a church. It's why we need to see ourselves. It's why we need to come together. Another thing that occurred to me is how important it is for other believers to be part of the assembly. How important it is for believers just to be in the assembly and to talk to people. Never once. I'm not saying this, you know, in the wrong way. But uh, several times when I went to church, I wasn't wearing a suit. I just, I was dressed uh, 
you know, just wearing a collared shirt, kind of look about like Shamir's dressed. Not not as stylish, but you know, that style of clothes that Shamir's dressed, and I had my beard. And there wasn't anything really about the way I was dressed that tell you that I was a preacher or that I was, uh, you know, I, you can't tell somebody's a Christian by the way they're dressed. Nobody asked me if I was born again. Nobody asked if, um, any, you know, if I had any spiritual need. And I just think so often at times what it must be like to come into this place. And I want to challenge you as believers. What'd you come for? What did you come to see? Did you come to hear Charlie sing? Did you come to see his white jacket? No. What did you come for? What did you come for? You know, I would say, probably you'd say, well, Pastor, I came for the same reason you did. I need to be fed. I need to hear from God. Well, good. What will make anyone else come? See, we've got a world that is lost, dying, and going to hell, literally. I mean, we just... It's just the the... the need is just so overwhelming it's, it's beyond description and the question is what are we doing what are you doing if somebody were to ask you why would you go to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church a little hole in the wall building on the side of Safeway what would you go to see what did you go to see did you go to hear Andrew sing did you go to hear the piano play? Did you go to ride on the bus? Did you go to get donuts in Sunday school class? What did you go for? Do you have an answer for them? Do you have an answer for them? There's truth there. There's a place I can go and hear truth. There's a place where the Word of God is preached and declared. And Christian, I'm not saying it's never so with other places. I think it is so. But it ought to be so frequently enough that you can expect it, can't you? Somebody in Miami Beach this last week was telling me, Pastor, we need to come up with something that tells people what's special about our church. And I love that, the way they said it. They said, we need to tell them about what's different about our church. What's different about our church? You know, what is different about our church? You were to ask to describe your church, the one you go to, the one you're part of. How would you describe it? And God help us to be a place that, well, Jesus, the gospel. The gospel's preached there. You can meet Jesus. You can learn about Him. You can be fed. And you can grow. And it's worth going to. How about it? What are you looking for? What did you go out to see? Jesus said. A reed shaking in the wind. What did you go out to see? A man in fine raiment, fine clothing. Is that what you went to see? What did you go to see? A prophet. Jesus said, John the Baptist, he was more than a prophet. There, hasn't, there wasn't born, Jesus said, among women, a man, a better man than John the Baptist. And then Jesus said, but I'm telling you that in the kingdom of heaven, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Jesus said, we've got a great message. And it was a great message because he's a great Savior. My friend, if you'll get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, Get to know Him as your Savior. You'll just let God have everything in your life. You'll let His Holy Spirit work on you. You'll get into His Word. You'll begin to mine spiritual treasures. That'll help you, first of all, to have forgiveness of your sins. They'll help you to have spiritual victory. They'll help you to have an eternal life. They'll have, help you to have hope. And then they'll put you in an economy where the very least person there is greater than John the Baptist. And that's worthwhile, isn't it? And I think that to some degree that the world is sick of religion, don't you? I think the world's sick of religion. Oh, there's people that want religion instead of Jesus. But I think that's the ex-church crowd more than anything else. I think that what the world wants is God. We want the truth. And if they just knew there was truth somewhere, I think they'd come. What about it? I've heard people say before, you know what, the reason I don't go to church is because it's full of hypocrites. Well, at least you're not there is usually what I feel like saying. You know, so it ain't that bad. But uh, no, the fact of the matter is, is that the church is full of imperfect people. We know that. But do we have perfect, imperfect people?
are trying to grow in our church. That's what we need. We need to have the kind of imperfect people that realize, you know, I'm not nothing. I'm not anything, but God's making something out of me. God's changing me. We need to be tender-hearted. We need to be seeking the Lord, seeking revival. And we need to be so that if you were to ask somebody the question, what did you go there to see? What did you go in there for? What did you go for? Well, I went to find God. Did you find Him? You ought to be able to say, yes, I did. And you can too. Let's be that kind of a church Christian, can we? It's kind of a home crowd today. It's kind of one of these groups you can talk this way to. Let's be that kind of a church. Let's kind of be the kind of church where when people say, where should I go to find truth? He can say, I know exactly where to go. <coughs> Point and lead the way. Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us to see how important it is every single service to be in our places, to be worshiping you. Help us to see how important it is, God, for people to have a place where they could go, even if it's an out-of-the-way place, even if it's a place that isn't on the beaten path or where most people could go, but a place where the message, the Word gets out, that the Gospel is being preached so much so that people say, there's Jesus. Jesus is there. Lord, I pray that you would be, Your Son would be lifted up and glorified by our church. And I pray that You would help us to practice the things that we preached this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a come-forward invitation. This morning we're going to do things just a little differently. I'm just going to dismiss everyone. I'd like you to consider the message and apply it. And if God lays something on your heart and says, you know what, this is what I need to be in light of what God wants me to be, then would you respond? Would you just do that? You're dismissed.